pleasure as always to come and be a part of the radio broadcast, sitting in for our illustrious mayor, Sheldon Neely. It's a joy and delight to be able to do that. Uh, it's a beautiful day out. We have some great hosts on um, the broadcast today. We've got some good information for you. And so we want to start our um, broadcast out, as always, with a word of prayer. So join me, if you will. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for this day that you have made, Father. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it. Father God, we continue to thank you for all your goodness and all your blessings and your mindfulness toward us, Father God. We, Lord God, lift up, uh, as your word says, that we ought to pray for those that are in authority. So we do pray for our mayor today and our our, our our county commissioners and our, our council people, Lord God, and our clerk. We declare, Father God, that a place of harmony, Lord God, will be discovered and dwelled in. You said that that's the place that you command your blessings, and truly that's our desire for the city of Flint and all of its residents. So we ask that you be with us on this call today, that again, uh, the information that will be shared, Lord God, will be great information that will uh, be a blessing and enlightenment to the hearers. We ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, so there are um, some great things happening. We had, first of all, we had a great week in the city of Flint uh, last week. One of the things being uh, the unveiling of our statue uh, to the late uh, mayor, uh, Dr. Um, I'm sorry, not Dr., but uh, Floyd J. McCree. Um, and I, I saw a segment on television last night with his nephew, Kyle, and he was uh, just referring to um, his grandson, his, I'm sorry, his grandson, Kyle. And um he was just referring to his uh, uncle, um, his mm -hmm. grandfather, as being um, the the people's mayor, and what a delight it was to see his statue now at the people's house here at City Hall. And so it was just a wonderful day celebrating with the family, and the program was wonderful. And even in spite of the rain, we still get out, and the unveiling was great. And so that was a, a, a good kickoff uh, to our week last week at City Hall. And then, of course, um, the members of 1600, uh, the union, uh, finally got a contract. They hadn't had a, uh, one since 2016, no other administration had be, been able to do that. But under our leadership with our mayor and the staff and all of the men and women, uh, the, uh, the local working together, um, our HR and um, everyone involved with it just did a great job. And so all of those members um, of 1600, myself included, um, are just uh, excited and, and grateful that the work uh, was put in and the outcome uh, was great for us. And so, again, just a lot of good things are happening. And that's why we're on the show, our community broadcast every week to give you good information and um, give you some truths to what's actually going on. I know there's a lot of uh, hearsay, a lot of rumors, um, a lot of disparity, really. Um, but we are not without hope, as the Word of God teaches us. We are um, very um, rooted and grounded here in this administration and faith and believing that all things are possible to them that believe. And so we are moving forward. And so uh, we are excited to be one Flint and we invite you to take on that mindset. That, you know, again, the place of unity, harmony is where God commands his blessings. And so when we move together in oneness, then we can see the, the outpouring of those blessings and the, um, the strength that we have when we come together uh divided we are scattered we're, we're uh weak we're disenfranchised but together unified we can do great things and so on the call with me today i have two wonderful people who are helping um our community do great things and so i want to welcome to the broadcast um mr michael freeman this morning who is the executive director of genesee county land bank good morning mr freeman Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this morning. It's a delight to have you, and I'm excited about the things that you'll be sharing. And then also we have our our um, our uh, rock hard <laughs> Dr. Furholder, who has been with us um, for just she's like a steady a steady part of this broadcast. And so, good morning, Dr. Furholder. Thank you so much for joining us once again this morning. Yeah, always good morning, Vanessa. Good morning. I hadn't had a chance to talk to you, Dr. Furholden, since um, there's a, a new appointment, I think. Uh, I, I read a press release from uh, the governor's office, a, a new board or something that you're a part of. Is that correct? Oh, no, Vanessa. It's not a new board. Mm -hmm. I accepted a position. A position? I am the new, a new position starting July 1. I am the dean of the NYU School of Global Public Health. 
Global Public Health. Congratulations. Yeah. That's awesome. Oh, I'm just so, so proud. I've been in New York City, yep, and leading the charge on the global stage for public health equity and health equity, yep. Wow, and that's so um, such a blessing. And it's, I, I just couldn't think of anyone better that they could choose for that. And your commitment to um, to local, to you know the the people here locally and across the state, your faithfulness has opened up a door for you to be on that global, that national platform. And we're just so proud of you. And congratulations with that. Thank you. So with that, I'm, I'm sad to hear that you'll be in uh, New York, but at least Tommy and I will have some place that we can come and visit and know somebody in the city. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? You got a friend in New York. Yes, 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 yes. So um, myself, I want to start with um, uh, just being transparent. I've really become very laxed with um, all my COVID precautions. And I know that that's not a good thing because I still hear people uh who are uh, being affected um, by COVID. And so um, the sense of normalcy that maybe we've been low to, just wanting a desire for things just to be as they were. Um, can you kind of speak to that and just give us a heads up as to where we should be and the, the things that we should be mindful of in this season? Yeah, sure. So um, if the numbers are really um, interesting thing, right? They, they, We've had in the past what we call surges. And the surges is where we see a real sharp increase in the number of cases and it happens pretty rapidly. We don't think we're going to quite have a surge right now, but everybody's heard about BA2, this new sub variant of the Omicron strain of COVID. So what's happening is we're starting to see little upticks in places. Some places are experiencing what they might call a surge, but that's not what's happening in Michigan. That's not what's happening in Flint and Genesee County. And we did see a little bit of an increase in cases last week. In Flint last week, we went from 12 to 21 cases. In the county overall, we went from 102 to 84. So these are not huge changes, but there, there's a little bit of fluctuation that's happening. So what I encourage people to do is to still stay the course. The pandemic is not over, but it is in a different sort of stage, if you will. So I still encourage people, if you're going into large indoor gatherings, I do encourage people to be mad. Being outdoors is fine. Being in environments that aren't densely populated are fine. Still encouraging people to get that vaccine. It's a foundational piece of a strong prevention strategy. It's not the only thing. It's not going to solve all the problems, but it has been shown very effective at reducing the risk of people getting severe illness or uh, being hospitalized or dying. And, you know, I had a very good friend I just found out that died from COVID earlier this year. She's my exact same age of 47. This is one of those things where it doesn't discriminate based on age or race or health status like that. People who are sicker before COVID are more likely to have problems, but we don't really understand why it is that some people do so poorly with this disease and others. So I still maintain prevention as our best strategy. And always, always, the very first line of defense that everybody should be doing is practicing good hand hygiene. Keeping your hands clean and keeping your hands out of your face is so critically important. Because oftentimes, even when people have a mask on, it's on their hands, they touch the face, they touch their eyes. Even if they've done the right thing, they've gotten the vaccine, they wear their mask. They will cross contaminate themselves by having their hands touch surfaces or other things out in the world. Then they touch their face or their mouth, and before you know it, they, they um, end up infected. So that's my advice for people. I know people are looking forward to a better summer. Um, than we had last year, and I think we can do that. Just encouraging everybody to keep those basic prevention practices in place. Yeah, and it's so easy to do, especially, um, you know, it's um, just being mindful of it, I think, is the most important thing. But looking at uh, all of the things that we had to endure and we've gone through over the last couple of years, just being mindful to uh, keep our hands clean and uh, keeping them out of our face and eyes, as you mentioned. <laughs> That's a, a a lot easier load than some of the things that we've had to deal with in, in the months uh, prior. So that's that's good. But we all recognize. I know people are over COVID. Aren't you over COVID? I'm so over COVID. I'm so over I'm COVID. Like, so over COVID. Mm-hmm. I can't even tell you how many people I've met, you know, sort of out in the world or bumped into them and didn't recognize them because we had masks on. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking them dead in the face. I'm standing right near them. You know, I have this distinctive raspy voice. 
So if I say something, people say, oh, God, they're for But mm-hmm. they won't recognize me because of the mask. Right. It is by, and then I'm, I've, there's a lot of people that I've met virt- virtually during the pandemic. We met over Zoom mm-hmm. and have worked together and worked closely together. And then I meet them in person and don't even recognize them because they got the mask and what, you know, whatever. So I do understand it's really graded on people mm-hmm. and taking it so And what I always remind people is we're over COVID, but COVID ain't over us. So don't forget that. Wow. Yeah, my, that's the mic drop. <laughs> that's so true. And, and you're absolutely right about the whole mask thing, you know, just being out in the community, in the grocery store, wherever, and someone will speak, and I'll be like, who's under the mask? Like, show me your face. I don't know. I don't know who you are, you know, and that has, you know, again, yeah. been a norm, but uh, COVID it ain't over us, as you said. So we still just have to make sure that we're doing the, the needful things to keep our, ourselves uh healthy and if you're like me who um you know i have a a, a mother uh that uh, battles some things and so i'm always concerned about her being healthy and then i'm uh part of a care caretaking network for my 90 a year old grandmother and so the, this these types of things just you know i bang them in my head because of course i would want to do anything you know to bring any anything in her home or, or make her ill in any way so when we look at um, ourselves being health healthy and then of course public health it's about all of us working together uh to ensure that we're, we're all better together right so yeah absolutely absolutely and the power of all of these strategies are amplified when everybody does them mm-hmm. one way masking provides some protection right so if you're the only one that's not a mask you are giving yourself some level of protection mm-hmm. but if everybody in the space is masked the level of protection goes through the roof. Right. It's the same with everything. The vaccine works when we get a critical mass of people in community vaccinated. Mm-hmm. You know, so this notion that we're better together and that when we're in it together, we can do better. That's real and that's scientific. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, I, 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 I understand all sides of it. Like I said, I know that people are very much just trying to get back to the way things were. But the only caution that I have about that is, even though we've done a tremendous job in the state of Michigan and in the school of split of closing that racial disparity gap in COVID mm-hmm. across the country, um, and, and even still historically, there are still some other kinds of disparities that exist. So even though African Americans are not now disproportionately represented in COVID cases and deaths, the average age of death for COVID is younger for African Americans. Wow. So there's still some nuances and things that are happening. I told you my friend who died in January, she was 47. Yeah. Like 47. Right. Remember when the pandemic started, we thought that the people who were going to die and get really sick, they were going to be old and or already sick. Right. And then everybody at this point knows somebody who wasn't that old and wasn't sick. Before they got COVID, who died? Exactly, exactly. You know, so and we true. just don't know who, who, who that might be and, and how it might affect somebody. Mm-hmm. So I still maintain, and we are speaking to somebody who's had COVID not once but twice. I had COVID twice. Mm-hmm. I haven't shared a lot about this. I suffered terrible brain fog in the months following mm-hmm. my second COVID infection, which was just last year year right after Thanksgiving. Mm-hmm. I went to an event, I got logged into a sense of security thinking I would be safe because I was at the wedding of a physician. Mm-hmm. And everybody at the wedding was vaccinated and most people were boosted. Mm-hmm. And in fact somebody brought Omicron to the party and then some unknown but large number of people at the wedding got COVID. Wow. And I had a very, very mild case. It was mild. But I noticed after I recovered, I'm on the Zoom and I'm talking and I would lose my train of thought. Mm. I would be speaking and I would want to say a word and no matter how hard I thought about it, I couldn't get the word to come out of my mouth. Mm. And my brilliant mind and my ability to communicate my thoughts powerfully and effectively is my secret sauce. So for months, <laughs> I was off and I was worried. I was like, who am I if I can't get my thoughts straight right. and communicate them clearly? Mm-hmm. And I'm going to be honest, it took about three months for me to start to feel normal again. Mm-hmm. So I had to start writing stuff down, even on this broadcast. I would be on the broadcast, and if the mayor asked me a question, and it was like a two-part question, 
I would have to write the first part down or I would forget it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. The people don't understand that. And it's funny because one of my couple of symptoms was I had a terrible headache. I had a terrible headache. And that headache was because COVID was working on my brain. Mm -hmm. Those H2 receptors that the disease starts COVID to attack us to are all through your body. And I think that headache was because they were just doing some stuff in my brain. Mm -hmm. And it took my brain a while to recover and heal from that. So again, prevention is our best strategy. Because mm -hmm. even if you don't die of COVID or get severely ill, there are real consequences and people do live with what's called long COVID. And now we know it looks different ways for different people. For some people, if they go on a kidney failure, for people like me, it's this extended month of brain fog, which was terrible. I was so worried that this was not going to get better. And who would I then be and how would my life look mm -hmm. if I did not fully recover from this thing? So prevention, prevention, prevention. That's yeah. what I'm pushing. Well, I'm so glad you shared that. I was talking to a friend recently who had a loved one that uh, she takes care of that um, she's noticed some of that brain fog that you're speaking of, and she's been extremely concerned. And so thank you for being so candid because I feel like I have some some hope to share with her. Like it's a part of, you know, the process of recovery, you know, with COVID and just to um, encourage her in that way. So I, I do appreciate you being so candid with that. And again, um, it's a it's a great segue for um, uh Mr. Freeman, that's on today, this whole aspect of us working together and us, you know, everybody being safe together. We have an initiative where uh, something on, on the table here uh, in the city of Flint, and it's a huge collaborative uh, with us working together, and it's going to change uh, even some aspects of public health in our community. Mr. Freeman, let's talk about uh, what's on the table with our uh, collaboration with our blight elimination plan. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy that you started with the idea about public health because this really is an issue of public health and environmental justice. Mm -hmm. And this is typically affecting the neighborhoods which are, are considered left behind. You know, the residents of the city who feel like they're not getting the attention that they deserve. Right. And honestly, we have a solution to that now uh, by having a comprehensive citywide demolition program. Now, this is a historic opportunity for us to bring together partners that, you know, before we did have a large demolition program and it was under the hardest hit program, uh, where there was $67.5 million, which um, helped us tear down 4,700 properties in the city of Flint. Um, but that was one large uh, allocation of dollars that went through the state and that was administered, but it had geographic restrictions and you could only demo in certain areas of the city. Um, we pushed the boundaries as much as we possibly could, but it did not represent a true citywide demolition program. Mm -hmm. This time with the ARPA funds, which are coming from the federal government, which are available at the local county and the state level. Right. That's where we came up with this idea of let's get everybody to sit down at the table, knowing that the city of Flint dollars are limited. And we there's a lot of activities that we want to be able to fund locally um, and not, you know, not just to do a demolition program, but mm -hmm. crime prevention, technology, things that will actually improve quality of life. We knew we had to start leveraging. So right. it can't all be paid for by the city of Flint's uh allocation of these ARPA funds right so that's when we started working together with the administration with the mayor and council members we started working with county commissioners um local foundations the Mott foundation was at the table where we all sat down and said you know the first goal for me was can we get a dollar for dollar leverage for this out of the city mm -hmm. um because this is a true historic partnership and we are all working together we actually now have a proposal which has been presented to city council where we're actually at two dollars for every one dollar that the city puts into this program wow. so so our total bill for this you know to hit every neighborhood in the city of flint with these unfunded demos that have been legacy issues for years and years mm -hmm. uh we came up with a price tag of 45.3 million dollars to take down everything that we currently have that needs to be demolished so when we went to our partners uh, with between the county and the Mott Foundation, 
uh, they decided to do our dollar for dollar match. So that's where we got that. And then the land bank actually started doing more outreach, working with the administration to come up with federal funding. Uh, like Congressman Kildee just got us a million dollars that's coming through the omnibus package. Uh, we're working with the state of Michigan to come up with additional dollars. The county treasurer, Deb Cherry, is actually bringing $4.5 million to the table. So effectively, by the end of this, we're going to receive $2 for every $1 that the city of Flint puts into this countywide program. And the thing about this countywide program is that we are going to be demolishing properties that we have outside the city of Flint that are on that same list. Mm -hmm. uh, but 94% of the funding and 94% of the demolitions will all be taking place in the city of Flint. And that so. is such great news because a lot of times, myself included, I, you know, and it is a known fact that we as, um, I'll use this term loosely, Flintstones, we feel like, you know, sometimes Flint simply gets the short end of the stick. And like, you know, we don't yep. see the things happening in the inner city as we do in, you know, outside in, in the county and the townships. So to, to hear that 94% of all of this money will be used in the inner city is just it, it's awesome. It's, it, it's, it's truly exciting to hear it. that that will make the, the impact and the change that we've all been wa wanting to see as it relates to, to cleanups and demolitions in our city. Um, you know, that'll, that'll do it. <laughs> that, that will yeah, do it. Absolutely. You know, we did, we, we actually did the analysis. We have 7,000 households in the city that are affected by a poor or substandard property. Mm -hmm. That's 21,000 people. If you think there's just three people in a household, and generally there's, there's more than three people in a household, mm -hmm. but if you just did that simple math, that's 21,000 people. That's basically one fourth of our entire city, the residents of our city, mm -hmm. who are suffering because they have this blighted, abandoned structure that mm -hmm. came through foreclosure. You know, it, it's it's going to have an enormous impact. And if you think about, it's not just even demolishing that structure and making it safe and making the street look nicer, but if, if think about the other like spillover effects. Housing yes. values we've seen go up 4.2% per household uh, when we do a demolition. So mm -hmm. you see housing values go up. I know a lot of people who have been denied insurance or they pay extremely high insurance right. because they actually have that blighted structure next to them. Mm -hmm. If we can delete that property, it's going to save Flint residents money. Mm -hmm. And it's going to start rebuilding our tax base where, you know, it, it's when you see all these households around these blighted homes, um, when their their values go up, the city does better because it actually can generate more tax revenue that pays for the goods and services for all Flint residents. Yeah. So, and I, I think one of the most important things, we saw there was research out of Philadelphia that showed that actually every $1 municipal government puts into their demolition program, mm -hmm. it's a 79 dollar return on investment when it comes to public safety and crime wow. because you're actually seeing that you're seeing decreases in criminal behavior mm -hmm. you know you have you know think about it every incident you have that is crime related involves you know police coming you know emergency personnel mm -hmm. people go to the hospital there's uncompensated care you think about all these these issues related to crime and that's directly relevant when you look at these abandoned houses yeah. you know, people think that it's an uncared for area and that you know people have left it and we want to show that we care and this has to be in every part of the city every neighborhood needs to benefit from this program so this time we're not going to have the limitations that we had with the previous dollars because even if the federal government came in and imposed some sort of geographic restriction, we have foundation dollars. And those foundation dollars will have no geographic restriction and we can go anywhere in the city. So I, I really think that this is a historic opportunity. I, I met with city council where they looked at the initial resolution to initiate this program. And, uh, you know, it's, it's never easy. There's a lot of questions. I was there for three hours answering and I'm sure they were probably really exhausted listening to the talk. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what? We got through a lot of content uh -huh. and a lot of, you know, what's wrong? What can we do? And quite honestly, you know, this, this deal that we have been provided, 
you know, this is this is a chance for the city and the county to finally work together. Yes. And, and it's and we're working around the city, you know, the city master plan. And I know that there's a lot of questions about relevance and mm-hmm. update. Um, but at the core, the value here is let's get rid of blight in the city of Flint. Absolutely. Let's make safer streets, make more beautiful streets mm-hmm. where people feel safe and they're they're proud of their neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And every neighborhood should be able to benefit this, just not specific to you. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when, when you think about this whole wraparound effect of this uh, transpiring, I was just at my, uh, my goddaughter's house uh, yesterday, a single mom, and I stopped by uh, to pick something up at her house and she's, uh, uh, purchased a home. She owns her own home and she's doing some renovations inside. Her house looks beautiful. And then I was sitting in her driveway and I looked across through her backyard, her fenced in yard to the backyard of the home next door. And it's full of trash, full of tires, an old garage that's about to fall down. And I was like, well, that's just terrible. You know, I'm thinking about, you know, here she is putting all this money in her home and she has little kids yep. that go outside and play in this backyard. And that's their that's their landscape. That's their scenery. That's what they get to look at every day when they go outside and play. And I'm like, no, I have to figure yeah. something out, you know. So um, just to hear, you know, that this is on the table uh, and the partnership and the collaborative that that we um, that we have here, it, it meets right, you know, right where we live. We'll see those wholesale changes for people that we know and love, you know, not, not just our community at large, but we'll see our individual communities and neighborhoods change by by this collaborative. And so it's it's just awesome news. What has to happen yeah. for this actually to transpire? So what, what will happen is ideally, let's say when we actually have the agreement with city council and the resolution is passed, mm-hmm. I'll have everybody sign on to their, their funding, get their contracts lined up, and then we can begin. In fact, we've already started at the land bank by re-inspecting all of the properties that we have, which are on this list. You know, sometimes there can be a house fire in one property that took a low priority demolition and it made it like top priority. And we have to know exactly where we're at right now. So we actually move in the right fashion that we're actually taking down emergencies first Mm -hmm. and that we work through, you know, our inventory yeah, one thing we're also doing too is we're re-examining our inventory too because I think some properties were on the demo list that actually may be salvageable and the market has gotten better. People want to invest in Flint properties for yes. home ownership. Uh, you know, like uh, neighbors want to buy a house next door, and for some reason, you know, after this pandemic, it seems that you know, housing rehab is becoming you know more of a private function versus just nonprofits oh, doing it. Yeah. So we're, we're making sure that we're not, you know, be, you know, we're the houses that have to come down are the ones that absolutely have to come down first and foremost, unless we can find a responsible owner for that. So uh, we have our list. We have, we have to work with consumers energy and we actually have to have them do all the cuts, utility cuts for each of the properties. We have to have environmental consultants look at the properties as well, because that's another issue. It's like everybody thinks that demo is a process of just picking a house and tearing it down. And the tearing down is the easy part. Yeah. It's all of the federal rules and requirements and regulations, because public safety is our, our main issue. We have to make sure that people are not going to get sick by, by these demolitions. Right. You know, asbestos is in a lot of these houses. And then when you tear down a house, asbestos goes airborne. And then if we don't do all the remediation beforehand, people around these houses will be breathing it in. Right. So, so I, I typically hear people say, oh, yeah, why, why is demo so expensive? Well, we're using federal funds that have federal rules and requirements as how you tear it down. Um, and so we have to comply with that because whether it's a city or the land bank, they're like, you have that many houses in your community that need to be torn down. The mm-hmm. state and the federal government are all over us. Well, listen, we do, have the, we, we do have the lowest demo cost in the state, though. I mean, we're actually cheaper than anywhere else, which is the really good thing for mm-hmm. us. Um, and so, you know, but it still is expensive to tear these down. We're looking at an average of about $15,000 per unit. Uh, residential unit to tear it down, and then it's about sixty-five uh, thousand, sixty-six thousand dollars to actually tear down the commercial structures, which right. 
typically have a lot more environmental issues in them. Well, look, this is so, a big project. There's a lot at stake, a lot on the table. Uh, Mr. Freeman, thank you so yeah. much for all of the information that you shared. Uh, Dr. Furholden, thank you as well. Listen, call your council person and, and tell them that you heard about this uh, uh, collaborative issue that can help our communities. Let them know that you want to see this thing passed and, and, and let's get to work with cleaning up our neighborhoods. Thank you guys so much for joining us on today's broadcast. We look forward to uh, talking to you on our next show. God bless you and have a good day. Thank you. God bless. Thank you.